If you asked a railway maintenance engineer to name their top five biggest risks, I would place a large bet on the fact that all of them will state switches in some way. Switches are the moving piece of track that allows trains to change lines. They're designed to transfer wheels from one rail to another. This function places high lateral loads on the switch blades, which can cause wear, defects, or even derailments in the worst case. In this video, we're going to look at how lubrication keeps the trains on the track as they pass over switches and gives switches themselves the longest life possible. Through my time within network rail maintenance, there was one brand that would always be in the stores, and that was the sponsor of this video, Interflon. Interflon's range of lubricants and other products cover all the bases for railway maintainers. They have products for all parts of the railway where the smooth movement of components is critical to keeping trains moving on time and realising full asset life. This can be from the inside of point machines that swing the points to the counterweights that ensure the overhead line is correctly tensioned at all times. They even have their leaf guard solution that solves the issues of leaves on the line that all railway people love being asked to explain by their friends. For me, I used Interflon's Metal Clean to remove even the most stubborn build-up on switches so I could undertake a detailed inspection for defects. Afterwards, I would use their Grease OG to give the best protection to the switch tip from damage and wear. As you'll see later in this video, Interflon's Grease OG really has changed the way railway switches are lubricated. Switch blades are subjected to different loads and forces than plain line rails for two main reasons. Firstly is the fact that they are turning the train and at a sharper radius than would be seen in plain line in some instances. The extent of this does depend on both the length of the switch and the turnout radius. The switch length denotes the length of the planed or reduced section of rail that transfers the wheel between rails. The shorter this is, the quicker the transfers and the higher the force. The turnout radius is the radius of the switch and the tightness of this turnout. Short switches are often used for tight radius turnouts. As the radius decreases, it increases the lateral or outward force. This lateral force will be present in all switches, but increases as this radius tightens. Look at the difference between these two switch layouts. The one on the right is the higher speed, so it has a longer switch length and a larger radius. There is also the wheel's angle of attack to consider, where the wheel is not running parallel to the rail, but at an angle to it. Traversing the switch and its radius brings in an angle of attack. The outer wheel is, in essence, driving slightly into the rail, the tighter the radius, the higher the angle of attack. The second reason is, as we touched on just a second ago, during its movement across the switch, the wheel is transferring from the stock rail to the switch rail. This changes how the wheel is in contact with the rail. You can see on the diagram shown that the contact shifts from a vertical contact on the top of the stock rail to include more lateral contact. It also changes where on the wheel the contact is, which is closer to the flange which in itself has a different profile. Both of these causes are more evident on the outer or steering half set, which is subjected to the higher loads. It is not uncommon on a set of switches to see this half set worn in a very different way to the inner half set. If you're interested on in the forces acting on trains as they travel around the railway network, why not check out my Guide to Cant ebook? It's free and available at the link below. You can see why Cant is so important on curves and how it helps manage the forces for both passengers and the rails. But if switches are designed correctly, what is the issue with these forces? Derailments at switches, specifically in facing moves, is a very real risk. And as the Network Rail 053 standard, which aims to control the risk of derailment at switches, states, the condition and profile of the rail components at switches greatly affects the risk of derailment at the switch entry and throughout the switch machining length. The standard then goes on to state that there are two main ways that derailments occur, a frontal derailment and a flange climb derailment. Both include an element of the wheel climbing the rail. So, to put it simply, the wear and damage to a switch rail, if not mitigated or repaired, creates the set of conditions that facilitate the train wheel climbing the rail face. Climbing the rail? How does a train wheel climb a rail? I can hear you thinking. Let's throw back to the forces I spoke about at the start of the video and also get a cross section up of a wheel and the switch. Awesome. Let's put these two forces on the diagram here. Firstly, the lateral forces acting on the wheel. Remember, these stem from the train going around the curve of the switch, which pushes the train outwards on the curve, or switch in our case. 
The second is the vertical force, acting straight down. This is the train's weight, effectively. These forces are trying to achieve different things, and are, as the 053 standard says, in competition with each other. The lateral force is trying to put the wheel over the top of the rail to continue its outward journey. The vertical force, on the other hand, is trying to keep the wheel sat nicely on top of the rail. But how do the wear or the damage that I've been banging on about factor into this little competition between our two forces here? It's all about angle. The angle at which the wheel flange contacts the switch rail. When the switch is brand new, this angle is perfect to keep the competition between the forces with the vertical force just winning, thereby stopping the wheel riding up or climbing over the rail and derailing. But as the switch wears or is damaged, the angle changes. This in turn can tip the balance in favour of the lateral force, which in turn increases the likelihood of the wheel flange climbing the rail. There is one last thing that needs to be considered, and for some of you, once I say what it is, it will be obvious why lubrication is so important. The last factor is the coefficient, or amount of friction, between the switch rail face and the wheel flange. Hands up if the penny has just dropped. High levels of friction allow the wheel to gain purchase or traction on the rail surface, resist the vertical force trying to push it down, and help the wheel move up the switch face. If there is low friction, it cannot gain any purchase, and the vertical forces easily keep the wheel from travelling up the switch face. All these factors can be brought together to quantify the risk of derailment using Nadal's formula. This was first published in 1896 by M.J. Nadal in a paper titled The Theory of Stability of Locomotives. Now, I did look for a photo of this gentleman, who we have to credit hugely with a formula that has stood the test of time, but all I got back was pictures of the tennis star Nadal. Not sure he's a fan of track engineering, but you never know. The formula is a ratio of the lateral forces to the vertical forces. There is a limit, known as Nadal's limit, which, if this ratio exceeds, means there is an increased level of flange climb derailment risk. This limit can be worked out using the following relationships. Note that the vertical force has now become the critical force. So, if the vertical force drops below this value, the risk of the derailment increases. What I want you to take away from this is not so much this critical limit, but the two factors on the right-hand side of the equation that feed into the critical limit. The wheel flange angle and the coefficient of friction. If you play around with the maths, it will become clear that the Nadal's limit is increased, therefore the derailment risk reduced, if one of two things happens. 1. The contact angle between the rail and wheel is increased. 2. The coefficient of friction is reduced. And vice versa, if the contact angle decreases or the friction increases, the derailment risk goes up. Straight to it, as most of you have likely guessed, but the best way to reduce the coefficient of friction is through the use of lubrication. Lubrication reduces the friction forces between the switch rail surface and the surface of the wheel. But the role of lubrication is not just limited to this. Lubrication also reduces the rate of wear on the switches. Wear, particularly side wear, can change the contact angle between the rail and the wheel. Side wear can also create a ramp at the switch tone for the wheel to physically ride up. Wearing of the switches can also lead to other defects, such as metal breaking out and the top of the switch cracking. Lubrication helps slow all of this down. In fact, wear can be reduced by a factor of 10. And the big plus? It's easy to do. Changing the contact angle or repairing defects needs the line closing, welders and grinders to attend, and a number of hours to complete painstaking work. Lubrication just requires applying to the switch routinely. Traditionally, the method for applying the lubrication was to put three dabs of grease on the switchblade and let the train wheel carry it through. But that's a bit hit and miss. Plus, the grease traditionally used tends to be thick and black. This obscures the switchblade making it hard to spot cracks and other defects. If it manages to get onto the back of the switch blade and hardens, it can actually stop the switch contacting the stock rail when it closes. This is known as standing off and can cause issues with detection. Basically, the signalling system confirming the switch is fully closed and safe for a train to travel across it. But these issues do not need to be a problem. This video's sponsor, Interflon's Grease OG, solves all of these issues. Firstly, it's clear meaning no issues with spotting defects on the switch rail. Secondly, it comes in a can and can be easily sprayed down the length of the switch blade. Thirdly, it is long lasting and water resistant. 
it's a great alternative to that horrible black stuff that ends up more on your PPE than anywhere else when you apply it and have to clean it off. I hope this video has given you a good appreciation for the importance of lubrication on a switchblade. It really is an easy win that is easy and low effort to apply, but it really does pay off. Please do give this video a like, hit that subscribe button to support the channel and drop any questions or queries in the comments below. Thank you.